So I'm actually going to talk about uh, what happens when you try and scale computing machinery for AI up to um, human or superhuman size. Um, and uh, obviously this is informed by Graphcore's own development of machinery for AI, uh, but I've tried to make it more general than that, actually. Um, Ultra-intelligence is an expression actually introduced in 1960-something um, by this chap, Irvin John Good, um, otherwise known as uh, Isaac Jakob Gudak, Polish by birth. Uh, he's one of the founding fathers of thinking about uh, the effect of building machines uh, that exceed human potential. Um, and he maintained uh, that the survival of man depends on the construction of such machines, um, early construction of such machines. He, he thought we would bring about our own destruction unless we had um, some, uh, some good advice from things cleverer than us, and he suggested that we make such a thing. Uh, and he defined ultra-intelligence as uh, a machine that can far surpass a human um, intellect, uh, any human intellect, across a sort of fairly broad range of tasks. And uh, uh, today is actually uh, Good Friday. It just occurred to me five minutes ago. So what better day to have a quote from uh, Jack Good on that subject. Um, so before I kick off, uh, just to remind that there are sort of two reasons to build big computers. Uh, there's a capability reason and a capacity reason. Um, capability machines uh, in AI uh, are machines which uh, strive to achieve superhuman capability. In other words, to do things we can't do. Um, and we're not quite sure what the impact of that is going to be on what happens next. Um, but obviously that's something we are trying to do now. And then uh, capacity machines are, are much more economically focused. In other words, uh, having discovered that you can get a machine to do something useful with AI techniques, um, can you do that useful thing uh, indefatigably and cheaply, more cheaply than, than applying humans to the job, even if a human could do the job? Um, so I'm going to focus on the capability end. In other words, uh, what kind of really big, really powerful machines are within uh, feasible grasp from where we are today? And what are the things that are limiting uh, powerful AI machinery? Um, now, capability is a function uh, of two sort of overall things. One is the design of the machine, of course, um, uh, and the other is the amount of educational effort. Remember, we're, we're building machines that learn here. Uh, so it's no good having a blank powerful machine, you, you want one that's educated. Um, the, the educational effort takes the form, obviously, of training data, which, which can be of good or bad quality and can be of small or large quantity. So, so obviously you want good quality, large quantity of uh, training data. Um, it's also a function of the scale of the model. Uh, if you like a large model, one that has a lot of learnable state, uh, has more potential uh, to do useful things than a small model. Uh, and I think we've seen that uh, throughout the development of AI so far. <clears throat> and then the design parameters, well, there is the effectiveness of the representations that are chosen to hold data in the machine. How do you hold information about language, about uh, images, about uh, graph relationships, etc., in the machine? Um, and then finally, the effectiveness of the processes for doing inference on the data that you have learned. Um, and also, uh, if you like, learning that data in the first place. So there's a, a training process and an inference process. Um, so those are the variables. Um, so since the interesting area is superhuman or ultra-intelligence, uh, what is the information scale of a human? Um, now humans, of course, have brains that have completely different structures to the artificial intelligences we use today. Uh, nevertheless, we can perhaps conjecture that if we, built, uh, if we wanted to build a machine that was more potent than a human, then it might need to hold at least as much state uh, in terms of bytes or bits. Um, humans have uh, some small number of hundreds of trillions of synaptic connections in their brains. Uh, so everything that you know, everything that you have experienced, everything you feel uh, that involves your brain is stored in that number of synaptic weights that have been learnt through your life. Uh, probably you've got many more than you really need or use. Uh, we know that, that uh, humans can recover from brain damage, for example. Um, so uh, there's probably a good degree of redundancy. Um, there's also been some very fascinating work on how accurately 
these uh, synaptic connections can be programmed. Uh, so in particular in the hippocampus, they, they have a bit resolution of between four and five bits, so about half a byte. So each, each of the 100 trillion or 200 trillion or whatever it is, parameters is about half a byte. So you can think of yourself as a container for about 100 terabytes of learned information by the time you've sort of matured into an adult human. Uh, obviously, a child human has uh, less information. Um, <clears throat> and maybe when we get really old, the amount of information drops off as well. Um, <laughs> now, artificial neural networks have, a, have one very strong property that's completely different from uh, real human brains, and that is that the, the weight state that is in an artificial neural network can be used uh, many times on, on each datum that passes through. This is the convolutional property, which is a characteristic of every uh, neural network in use today. And brains can't do that. If you like, one synaptic connection can't share its learned information with another synaptic connection. So a, a human brain, therefore, probably does need more weight than an artificial neural network to achieve the same job. Um, so given all that, and also given perhaps the fact that we don't need artificial intelligences to learn much of what we need to learn to function well as humans in a human society. In other words, they can be more specialist. If we had a brain-sized, a human brain-sized AI, we could just train it to do one thing really well and it wouldn't need to do anything else. Um, so given all that, um, the, the sort of starting conjecture is that maybe we need about 100 terabytes or 100 trillion learned parameters um, in a machine to unambiguously have a, a potential for ultra-intelligence. Obviously, it's just not going to achieve ultra-intelligence on its own, uh, but we'd need to have a machine of that sort of scale to have that potential. <clears throat> so we're going to think about building a machine of that scale. Um, what is the state of AI today? Uh, well, so... It's been in development, or artificial intelligence, at least as represented by today's neural network. That are 99% of AI done today. Um, it's been in development for the best part of a decade. Um, we have a master learning algorithm. That's quite a significant statement. Uh, we have elements of a sort of master model structure, like a synthetic cortex, if you like. Your brain's fairly homogenous. It deals with audio signals and video signals and other things, touch signals, it, using a fabric of essentially the same construction. Um, so if we could learn a similar fabric in an artificial sense, uh, then we would, uh, we'd have like a master model architecture. And we have elements of that that have emerged. I don't think it's complete yet. And then uh, finally, quite recently, uh, and I'll talk more about this, we have a decoupling of the, the scale of a artificial neural network in terms of its number of parameters from the amount of compute that is required to operate it. Uh, and this is really important. <clears throat> so those, those are the sort of three characteristics of where we are today. Um, the master learning algorithm, of course, is stochastic gradient descent, first order stochastic gradient descent by backpropagation. Anyone who codes these things will know that. Um, Everything, all, all neural networks today are trained with this master algorithm. And this alone has some interesting implications for hardware, for the construction of computers. Um, first of all, uh, we have found that neural networks can train reasonably effectively with weights of a couple of bytes, but we also need optimizer state um, to help them learn. Um, so we end up with a, a, a machine capacity that needs to be about 10 bytes per weight. Um, so, for 100 trillion parameters, brain size, you need about a petabyte. It's a lot of memory. Uh, it's not out of reach, but it's a lot of memory. Um, interestingly, we know also that that memory must live in semiconductor memory. It must be either static RAM or dynamic RAM. Um, how do we know that? Well, a solid state disk flash. Uh, would wear out if you tried to rewrite it a million times. And that's exactly what you need to do to run a training uh, on a neural network once. So uh, it's no good building a machine that's going to wear out with a single run of a program. Um, we also know, for example, magnetics and you know, tapes and disks are going to be too slow. So, so definitely that petabyte has to be in a, uh, SRAM or DRAM, and SRAM will be too expensive. So it's going to be in DRAM. We know that. Um, so that's quite a big statement. That's just the result of SGD being the master algorithm. <clears throat> 
Um, and uh, the other thing we know is that if you have to do, uh, say, a million or 100,000 iterations, um, and on each iteration you have to read the entire model and optimizer state, uh, compute with it, and then write it back again, which is how SGD works. If it takes you a second to do that, then a million iterations is going to take you 12 days. And you might be patient enough to wait 12 days to train your neural network. You might not. Uh, maybe you're patient enough to wait 100 days. I don't know. <laughs> but however patient you are, it's clear, clear that unless you can do that operation, read all the memory, and then write all the memory back, unless you can do that operation in a few seconds, you are going to run out of patience. Uh, so we also know that this memory, this petabyte of memory, has to be readable and writable at a speed of the order of a petabyte per second. Um, we also know another interesting thing, which is the data flow in this master algorithm is entirely predictable. Um, we know exactly when stuff moves. Uh, it's a sequential process intrinsically. There's no inherent parallelism except inside the operators. Uh, and this means that all of the automatic cache hierarchies of traditional programmable machines are, are now not useful. Um, you'd be far better off just putting down uh, memory, fixed memory, SRAM or DRAM, and moving stuff about explicitly in software. Uh, and again, that's, that's a big shift for hardware. <coughs> Here's an example of how not to do it. So I don't normally pick on my competitors, so I haven't left their name anonymous. <laughs> However, this is such an egregious arrangement, I, I do need to call it out. So one of the uh, companies purporting to enable brain scale uh, neural network training uh, thinks that the right way to do it is to put all the state in one box and all the compute in some different boxes. And there's a network device in between the two to move data out of one and into the other. The box that contains all the state has a relatively low bandwidth such that reading or writing all of the state in the box takes about four and a half hours. And remember, to run your training program once, you have to do that maybe a million times. So that means whatever the structure of the model in that box, and however much compute you apply on the right-hand side of the diagram, it will take 500 years to run a training program once. So that's obviously crazy. You could, of course, run a smaller model in less time. But in fact, only about 0.01% of the memory that you can fit in your big memory box is ever going to be deployable for an SGD learning. So that's, that's the way not to do it. What you should do instead, well, obviously, you should distribute the memory across all of those computing engines so that you maximize the bandwidth. So you don't, the worst thing you can do is centralize the memory. You need to distribute the memory. <coughs> right. There are also, I said there were some emergent characteristics of a master model, a kind of synthetic cortex. Uh, what are they? Well, first of all, all neural networks reduce their data to sets of vectors. It doesn't matter whether their data is human sentences or speech or pictures or videos or graphs. What we have discovered is that they can all be reduced usefully to sets of vectors. And the vectors sort of represent the data the representations. We've also discovered that multiple layers of incremental processing is useful. That's where the deep word in deep neural networks come from. They're all deep now, and it's very useful. Uh, and each layer is, it generally consists of some sort of linear process, usually a weighted sum, and then some pointwise non-linearity that follows that. Uh, we've also discovered that these layers are particularly easy uh, for us to learn a model if they uh, incrementally add a small amount to the representation vectors. And this is what's called residues. So almost all neural networks today are residue networks. Um, there were different ones in the early days, uh, sort of only a few years ago. Now they're all residues. Um, we've also discovered that it's quite efficient to alternate the interaction between the representation vectors uh, with, uh, if you like, processes on the representation vectors themselves. So alternating between vector and within vector processing. Uh, that's a pretty universal characteristic now. Um, and finally, uh, and this one's a bit more contentious, um, your cortex is fairly, not entirely, but fairly isotropic meaning that each you know, layer of your cortex appears to have a similar sort of structure. And that, that also has started to emerge in 
neural networks. Uh, they're not all like that, uh, but many neural networks actually now have uh, basically lots of repeats of the same type of layer structure. <coughs> now, um, <laughs> NVIDIA, bless them, uh, the 600 pound gorilla of the AI compute market today, uh, I think recently claimed in their, their latest uh, jamboree that they had increased the performance of AI computing by a factor of a million over the last decade. So I thought, a million? I better just check that number. Uh, the real number is 300, which I think is actually super, super impressive. Um, I think the, the other 3,000 came from using 3,000 GPUs. Um, but, you know, they were multi-chip computers long before AI, so I discount that. Uh, but nevertheless, there has been a 300x, roughly, increase in the peak arithmetic performance of a GPU in uh, basically 10 years since the uh, NVIDIA Maxwell to the Hopper, which hasn't quite arrived, but will certainly be with us next year. And that's, that's super impressive. So I thought I'd unpick it, and then we'll see whether or not much of that is repeatable. <laughs> so roughly a factor of four comes from shrinking from 32-bit numbers to 8-bit numbers. We know that AI arithmetic doesn't have to be very compute. That was very accurate, sorry. Um, and you get actually four squared as an efficiency factor because much of the operations are matrix operations. So if you like, you get the square of the effect of that size reduction. Um, so that's a factor of 16. That's the biggest single factor, changing the size of the arithmetic, uh, changing the size of the numbers the arithmetic's done on. The second biggest factor is advances in silicon processing technology, about uh, 8x uh, between 28 nanometers and 5 nanometers, uh, just in, in transistor density. Um, about 1.7x in clock speed, but at a cost in terms of power. Power's gone up by rather more than that, 2.8x. Uh, to do the same uh, work. <clears throat> and um, finally, how much is down to sort of changing the architecture? Obviously, uh, GPUs started off as graphics processors. Now they're more and more AI processors, so they have tried to retune the architecture to that purpose. 1.4x in 10 years uh, appears to have come from that. Uh, how repeatable is this? Uh, well, I think the reduction in arithmetic precision is probably tapped out. Maybe we can go to four bits. It'll be a sort of logarithmic representation with four bits. That's possible, but eight bits is difficult to work with already. Uh, and, and four bits is maybe possible, but just too difficult to bother. Um, the, uh, the increase in transistor density, uh, we probably get another 2x, uh, but it may take five years or, or more to get that other 2x. Moore's law is basically over in terms of uh, increasing transistor density at a rapid pace. Um, we can certainly get more from clock speed. Uh, it's entirely feasible to build uh, chips that run twice as fast as today's, maybe even more. But the consequence in power will be super linear. So if you want to double clock speed, you'll probably triple the power required to do so, and, and at some point that's going to be troublesome. Uh, and then finally, the 1.4x in terms of tuning architectures to AI, that's where I think the real meat is, and obviously that's GraphCore's mission to start off with a better architecture for AI in the first place. Uh, and there are several other companies uh, in the field uh, likewise trying to do that. Obviously, NVIDIA didn't have the luxury of starting with a, a clean sheet of paper. But I think there's, there's definitely room there. Um, but the takeaway from this slide is most of the sort of massive improvement of what happens on a silicon chip um, for, you know, in terms of applying silicon chips better to AI is, is done. They're not going to get that much better unless you are much more radical in architecture and you're prepared to spend power. Uh, and I think that's, that's how it's going to be. Uh, and this is a, a graph of uh, not transistor density uh, over time, which is sort of traditional way of plotting it, but actually performance per watt from a fixed silicon area. You probably all know there's a practical limit of how big a chip you can make. Uh, all players basically make maximum size chips. So how much work can you do per second with such a chip or per watt with such a chip? So this is performance per watt for a full size chip normalized. You can see the heyday of Moore's law at the beginning, um, about uh, a t doubling uh, every two years. Um, and, and then in 2005 at 90 nanometers, uh, what's called Denard scaling, which is traditional voltage scaling 
came to an abrupt end, and the pace of improvement of semiconductors uh, dropped dramatically to about 18% per year. And that's been the world we've lived in uh, over the last several years. Um, and what's happening now is it's dropping again. Um, there are actually multiple reasons for this, um, but it's uh, certainly related to limitations on the geometry of transistors, wires, and interconnections. Um, and we're not actually expecting more than about 5% per year improvement in uh, performance per watt or energy per operation. So turn up 2,000 or so increase in functional density over 25 years, fantastic. Uh, we may see some further increase, maybe another 2x or maybe a bit more than that in functional density, but we will not see any significant improvement in the energy efficiency from the silicon. We may from better architectures. Uh, and I think it's going to bottom out at something around a picojoule per real flop, floating point operation, one picojoule, or if you like, <coughs> uh, a megawatt per exaflop, uh, which is kind of more like where, sorry, a megajoule per exaflop, which is more like the uh, useful number of flops for training in your network. <coughs> um, so, not much more from silicon, sadly. Uh, State-of-the-art today is actually not even uh, picojoule uh, per op. Uh, it's about three picojoules per op. Uh, but I think there's some juice in it yet, so we'll probably get down to one. Um, and uh, that's for sort of infrastructure class machinery. In other words, the sort of machinery you put into big systems, uh, you know, uh, hyperscaler warehouses, data centers, uh, or supercomputers. About three picojoules per flop. Um, and uh, what does that mean? Well, if, if you've got a billion parameters, uh, you're probably going to take about 20 billion tokens to optimally train a network of that size. Um, and uh, there's a little reference there, a uh, very recent paper that uh, tries to articulate why that is. Uh, so you're going to need about 250 chips and 100 kilowatts for one hour. Um, so, you know, that's okay. Uh, but if I try to get up by a factor of 1,000, um, unfortunately, because most neural networks today are dense, in other words, every parameter interacts with every datum, if both the parameters go up by 1,000 and the data go up by 1,000, the compute goes up by a million. And suddenly you need 25,000 chips and a 10 megawatt power station for a year to run a program once. And that's one trillion parameters. So obviously we're not going to get to 100 trillion parameters, which is human. Um, so what is the way out? Well, brains do routing. <laughs> this is the key. Uh, so when you see something, uh, not all of your neurons in your brain fire. I mean, I guess if a tiger jumped out right now, a lot of them might fire, but mostly uh, your brain only uses a very small fraction of its machinery in response to any datum. In other words, it has an ability to steer input data to the useful parts of your brain where the parameters need to adapt to that data. And we have recently discovered how to do that in artificial neural networks. Um, so uh, what this allows is uh, the parametric capacity, in other words, the number of weights in an artificial neural network to grow without the compute growing. Or if you like, it will allow today's networks, the really big language networks like GPT-3, to stay the same size and actually the compute to go down and make them more usable, more dem democratizable. <laughs> it's also probably kind of in intuitive that, you know, take a language model, for example. What do you want a language model to do? Well, you want it to learn not only a language and a grammar, you probably want it to learn many languages so it can understand ideas in French or English or German or whatever, and the relationship between them. You also want it to be able to understand language to do with politics as well as language to do with science. Um, however, uh, a particular sentence is only going to be in one language. It's going to, only going to be about one subject. So it's kind of obvious that when a network is dealing with a particular datum, it only needs to access a small fraction of its learned information if, if it has a reasonable multifunctionality about it. And that's what routing is harnessing. Um, so that is kind of intuitively obvious that this is the way that artificial neural networks need to go. And I've kind of broken down the progress of deep neural networks so far into these three different uh, eras over 10 years. 
So first of all, we had the breakout of deep neural networks. Now, there's multi-layer structures that were unambiguously better than simple things like linear regression at modeling data. Um, and uh, we started to see the emergence of surprising capabilities, the ability of a neural network to recognize different people, for example. Um, and we thought, well, that's really interesting. Uh, so we made them bigger, and they became more powerful. And what limited the size of those things was the fact that we had to use curated data to train them. You had to say, this is a picture of uh, Jack, and this is a picture of Joe. Um, and a human had to do that labeling, so the data was expensive. So the scale of the models was limited by the cost of the data. Now, that all changed when the modern transformer-based language models emerged, and it now pervades over all forms of data, like uh, video transformers, for example. Um, it changed because we worked out how to get a neural network to learn from unlabeled data, uh, in the case of language, just by masking words out and asking it to fill in the gaps. And because the, the data, is, the ground truth is available, it doesn't need labeling. And there's a lot of data out there. You know, you can read Wikipedia and learn a lot about uh, language and the concepts in language from Wikipedia. And that presaged an enormous expansion in the size of uh, models. A factor of a thousand, roughly. We went from hundreds of millions of parameters up to hundreds of billions of parameters. But we stopped again. Uh, and we stopped because of this dense compute property, the fact that every datum has to interact with every weight, and that was a lot of flops. Um, so the third step is happening right now. And this is the uh, harnessing of these rooted networks that mean that every datum does not need to interact with every flop. And, and I'm, I'm hopeful that this will allow another factor of 1,000. And that's what we need to close the gap. And then you get to 100 trillion parameters, and voila, there's your human scale uh, model and it no more compute than we use today. I have to say that we haven't realized a thousand X step for that third um, break, breakout yet, but uh, we've already realized something like 50 X, so not bad. And uh, so here's a machine that Graphcore advertised uh, a couple of months ago when we announced our Bow platform. Uh, this is a machine that we are uh, uh, building, well, we're at least at the, at the step of building uh, the chips and the, uh, t the chassis components for this machine. We've not started laying out uh, racks yet, but we intend to. Um, and this is just to give you an idea of the scale of a machine. So in other words, this, this is a machine which unambiguously has more parametric state, more weight, than a human. So uh, it's not going to be ultra-intelligent until we work out how to achieve that in software, but at least it is a substrate for exploring the breakout of ultra-intelligence, the emergence of things that are smarter than people. Uh, and it's a big machine. It's um, 8,000 chips, um, $120 million, 10 megawatts, 10 exaflops, four petabytes, uh, all readable and writable in less than a second, as, as per my earlier requirements, so 10 petabytes a second. Huge machine, uh, but it would fit in a room, a uh, big room, <laughs> uh, and it's entirely feasible. This, is, this will not be the largest piece of supercomputer machinery ever built. Um, and I'm sure other people will try to build these things as well. In other words, now that we've had that third breakout step, the rooted networks, uh, ultra or machines with parametric state big enough to provide a platform for exploring ultra intelligence are feasible now. So takeaways. I see I have one minute left, so that's a good time. <laughs> Takeaways, uh, three of them. First of all, uh, ultra-intelligence in silicon is going to be expensive. You know, if you want 100 trillion parameters, uh, they're not going to be cheap in any known silicon technology, and also the compute is going to require a lot of watts for a long time on a big machine. So however we do it, for as long as it's in silicon, it's going to be expensive. However, it is feasible. In other words, people are going to build these machines. This is going to happen next, in the next couple of years, I think. Uh, secondly, and part of that, energy per flop is a wall. Now, silicon process technology is at the end of the road in terms of energy efficiency. So there is no escape from power, uh, whatever you do. If you do a certain amount of compute, you're gonna pay the price in power. Um, and in order to minimize that, you wanna minimize the compute, you wanna use routing to make a large uh, information capacity available without too much compute. And then finally, uh, for as long as first-order stochastic 
gradient descent remains the master algorithm of learning, uh, then that there is this bandwidth constraint on your memory. In other words, you will have to be able to read and write the massive amount of memory that you've built in, in less than, well, in uh, roughly a second. Um, and that implies uh, it must be in DRAM. But not only that, it must be in DRAM that's somewhat faster than traditional server class DIMMs, uh, if you know what they are. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. <laughs> we've, uh, we've got time for a couple of questions, if anyone in the audience would like to ask Simon anything. Yes, gentlemen here, down the front. When you say it's around uh, 120 million dollars to build this machine, uh, the training is comprised on the price, or, or the training is going to cost uh, extra from the under the 20 millions? Uh, no, that's Sorry, <laughs> uh, 120 million will be the cost of building the okay. machine, um, but uh, because its memory can be cycled in of order a second, less than a second. Uh, you could run a training program at full capacity in something like 10 days. Okay. Um, so the cost of operating it will be 10 megawatts okay. for 10 days to run one program. Yeah, okay, thanks. Any other questions from the audience at the moment? This gentleman there. Thanks for the, for the talk. Do you think the routing uh, strategy will help us on the explain explainability of the neural net? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, I would imagine it will, because routing will uh, obviously highlight the parts of the network that are responsive to particular data stimulus. In other words, we should be able to identify what individual pieces of our stored state, our AI structure, are responsible for. Um, obviously, we'll still have to then unpick what's going on there, but at least it localizes the, uh, the, the information. Uh, congratulations, uh, really at the, at the front, so true moonshots. Um, you mentioned at one point we need the software to go along. How much is this way that you are suggesting, the routing, going along this buzzword about neuromorphic and how much are you still believing in a more traditional hardware versus software uh, distinction? Uh, well, the, the, um, the routing networks that are being explored today are mostly transformer networks, transformer neural networks. Um, so they are not neuromorphic in, in any realistic sense. The, in, in fact, the biggest distinction between those types of networks and things that inherit more f structurally from neurology is this convolutional property. Um, so these are still convolutional um, and, you know, probably therefore more parametrically efficient than a neuromorphic structure would be. I mean, I, my personal view on neuromorphics is that it's unlikely that silicon that has completely different properties to uh, wetware uh, would be optimized if, the, if you try to apply exactly the same structural uh, properties to a learning machine. Uh, in other words, it may be entirely appropriate to build things that are not neuromorphic out of silicon. It might be the best thing to do. Uh, whereas if, you know, when we harness chemistry and manage to build machines out of chemistry, then perhaps they will be rather more neuromorphic. Uh, any thoughts on that? On, on the harnessing of chemistry, well, uh, uh, my, my daughter, who is uh, 18 years old, is about to embark on her career in uh, biochemistry, so I'm, I'm relying on her for that step. <laughs> any, we've got time for one more quick question, if anyone wants to ask, before we uh, move on to the next keynote. No? Thank you so much, Simon. That was brilliant. Really interesting. Thank you. Thank you.